And I'm just waiting for the signal that we're connected uh, live and, and we'll begin. Glad that people could find their way to coming here for the last session of the series this, this academic year. James, we're all good. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to, um, to uh, have you all attending the last um, episode for this academic year of cutting edge issues in development thinking and practice. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that we've been able to um, have Professor Mariano Mazzucato join us this afternoon. She's speaking to her new book, which has already gained a lot of notoriety, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. And today, the title is A Mission-Oriented Approach to Stakeholder Value, uh, which is um, um, re really developing on and drawn out of the work for the book. Uh, uh, Mariana Mazzucato is Professor in Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London. She's a founding director of the U University College's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Her work challenges orthodox thinking, which is why we like to invite her here, orthodox thinking about the role of the state and the private sector uh, in driving innovation. She's been looking at how economic value is created, measured and shared, and how market shaping policy can be designed in a mission oriented way, which is something I think she'll probably explain more to us today. So many of you know Mariana's groundbreaking book, The, the Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public Versus Private Sector Myths, which was published in 2018. This has really made an enormous contribution to new thinking um, and policy debates about industrial policy since the financial crisis um, were a decade ago. Mariana's work on innovation and on the role of the state in fostering it would never be more important uh, than now in the light of the environmental crisis and the multiple crises unleashed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm hoping you're all going to ask her when we get to the Q&A, really difficult and tough questions in this regard. I'm also really delighted to welcome back to the LSE, Dr. Jonathan DeJohn, who's a well-known development economist at SOAS, which I like to say is up the street when we think that we're notionally sitting at the LSE. Uh, I really miss the days when he was lecturing on our DV400 uh, core course in the MSC Development Studies and the crucial contributions he made to our Crisis States Research Center. So we're fortunate, we were really unfortunate to lose him to SOAS. Many of you know Jonathan's uh, from our co authored piece on political settlements. But he's an expert in his own right on industrialization and industrial policy. His book, From Windfall to Curse, on the political economy of oil and industrialization in Venezuela is already a classic. He's written extensively on taxation and tax uh, and state building and is deeply involved with major new research on the political economy of Brazil. So Jonathan, it's nice to have you back. Without further ado, Mariana, I'd like to turn it over to you and I know you probably want to share your screen. There we go. Yes. Well, thank you so much, James. And thank you, Jonathan, for agreeing to be a discussant. And thank you for all the participants online. So let me first share the screen. This is the bit which is always dangerous. You might be sharing your emails or family pictures. No, <laughs> this is great. We have my slides. And let me just put it on presentation mode. There we go. Good. So um, thank you. And I am sort of ashamedly or non-ashamedly going to be uh, uh, basically focusing on the book that has just come out. But what I really want to do, given the theme of the lecture series, is related as much as I can to kind of key issues in development economics and our understanding of how companies, nations, regions, and people 
develop. <laughs> um, and the reason I've called it a mission-oriented approach to capitalism is this notion of stakeholder capitalism is out there. It's talked about constantly in terms of how to avoid a lot of the problems that we currently face um, around financialization of the economy, around short-termism and different problems around corporate governance. And what I'll be arguing is that that concept will remain weak <laughs> if it remains within the silo of corporate governance. It has to go to the core of the system, to the core of capitalism and to the core of how public, private and third sector institutions actually relate to each other. And of course, also how they're governed internally. And I'll be kind of going back and forth from that uh, issue of intra-organizational governance, especially, but not only within state institutions, we can organize state institutions in different ways, just like we can organize corporate governance in different ways, and to the issue of the relationship, the ecosystem. What does it mean to have stakeholder capitalism at the center of the ecosystem? Um, and I'll be using the kind of key thesis from my new book that we need a more purpose-oriented economy, a mission-oriented economy in order to do that. And I also wanna make sure that I have time to clarify lots of misunderstandings that come from that approach. You know, This is not about a techno-centric, deterministic idea that we just need kind of a big moonshot, you know, lots of money thrown at a big project. It's almost the opposite of that. Um, and so I definitely would like to um, you know, both uh, address that during the lecture, but especially in our discussion. Um, and so the context that I begin the book with is, is the COVID moment. And I obviously began the book before that. It does take a long time to write books. So it didn't just begin last uh, February, but you know, what's happened over the last year, what we've realized over the last year is just how terribly prepared we are to confront this crisis. Similarly, terribly prepared uh, you know, to confront the climate crisis, which remains with us, it's just as strong. But just pausing for a minute on COVID, I mean, all the different challenges that this moment has thrown at humanity, at different nations and all the different actors is immense. Obviously the health challenge itself, whether it's, um, you know, health systems being well resourced enough to confront, you know, what essential workers require, which is enough personal protection equipment, but also enough, uh, you know, intra organizational again, governance will come back to later in terms of what do we even expect our health systems to do. Have we been resourcing them enough in the 10 years before the crisis, if not, even if you do throw a lot of money at it last minute is quite hard but also all the different things that have been, you know, that have had to roll out from the test and trace system to now the vaccine rollout to confronting the issue of the digital divide. I have four children at home uh, in London and I know that their access to, you know, digital technologies to good internet connections is so much better than um, that of many of their neighbors living in London, you know, let alone if we look at the developing world. So the digital divide itself has become something that we are all, you know, we, we knew about it, but we're even more aware about it now. And, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting how, I mean, interesting is a hard word to use in such a tragic time, but it's, it's important to realize that countries have experienced this in different ways. It is a global challenge, but those countries that have been investing in their intra-organizational capacity have actually done better. And even in the UK, where I think the test and trace system was quite a debacle, um, it was outsourced basically to some consulting companies like Deloitte, the vaccine rollout instead, which was nested within a decentralized community-based national health system through the GP practices has had a very different performance. So we need to you know, use these as case studies. Um, Kerala and Vietnam, uh, uh, two parts of the world that have for different reasons been investing a lot, not only within the public administration, but also in building trusted relationships between government, business, and academia, also due to their previous crises. Those are also really interesting case studies. And for all those who might be interested, we have, um, by we, I mean my Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. We're co-authoring a report with UNDP around this international experience and kind of looking at you know, what works, what worked, what didn't work, and what can we learn from um, these very different experiences. Uh, let's see if it moves, no, it's not moving. There we go. Um, and as I already mentioned, you know, COVID occurred on the back, of course, of the climate crisis last February, 2020. What we were seeing on our screens wasn't healthcare workers. These were flood uh, workers in places like Venice, where I'm from, firefighters in Australia and California. And unfortunately, we are simply not moving fast enough. If you just look last year, 55 billion 
uh, dollars worth in subsidies within the EU have gone to fossil fuel companies. Um, and 56% of the COVID-19 recovery funding that was allocated to energy companies and the G20 has gone to fossil fuel uh, projects. You know, so when Greta says, uh, if your house is on fire, what do you do? You don't sit there and debate and philosophize what to do, you get the hell out. Well, we're not getting out of this crisis uh, quick enough. Of course, there are, you know, positive movements and we should, uh, you know, look at also the, the positive changes that are happening, but there's no way that one could argue that we're moving uh, at the speed that we need. And of course, as I'll you know, talk about later, there's all sorts of other challenges <laughs> that we're not doing too well on. Uh, if you look at the 17 sustainable development goals on all the metrics underneath them, um, we again are, are not facing up to the challenges that we have. So that's really the symptom. That's the symptom of the problems that we're facing with the COVID uh, crisis, just the latest uh, symptom. And of course, there's also relationship. I don't have time to go into it now, but it's fascinating to read some of the scientific work uh, re uh, relating actually the COVID crisis with the climate crisis in terms of what we are doing to biodiversity, to um, the planet, planet, and also the way that we're becoming even closer and closer to animals due to the destruction, for example, of the rainforests that have viruses that we're not used to. But anyway, what I just want to focus on this next little bit is why it, it, you know, we actually have to go to the center of where the problem is. We can't just be looking at the symptoms, crisis after crisis after crisis, where of course many countries are still uh, recovering from the financial crisis uh, back in 2007, 2008. So financial crises, economic crises, climate crises, health crises, these are just symptoms of a system that is not working. And you know, I don't have too much time to look into the, the theories of why capitalism isn't working, but I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page on why that is. Um, and in doing so, we really need to remember that sometimes we get lazy with words, right? So you might hear sometimes, you know, a, a state-oriented system versus a market-oriented system. That doesn't make much sense because markets are outcomes of how we organize state institutions, business institutions, financial institutions, third sector institutions, including trade unions, and you can put them under the the heading of kind of civil society institutions. Without trade unions, we wouldn't have the eight hour workday. We wouldn't have the weekend, probably the best social innovation ever. So if we actually look at the interrelationships between all these different types of organizations, as I was mentioning in the beginning, that actually forms the kind of market that we have. And I'll come back to this point later, but just in looking at why deep change is needed, it's important to go actually to those organizations and see some of the dysfunctions that we've had. And the first, Again, this won't be a complete tour de force, but just to focus on some of the big issues. One is the financial system that we have has been uh, uh, becoming increasingly problematic. My previous book, The Value of Everything, uh, Making and Taking in the Global Economy focused on this problem where I looked at um, just, you know, finance is not doing its job. <laughs> um, we can go into different theories of finance, but in terms of the amount of financial resources that are actually going into the real economy, versus into other parts of the financial sector, uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, fire, um, the problem is, is quite easily seen there. And this graph here from the Bank of England, it was from a paper by Andy Haldane, just shows how much financial intermediation has been growing as a percentage of real gross value added uh, compared to the rest of the economy. And that is very much because finance has been financing finance. And you see that also just in terms of the amount, you know, even now, for example, with the um, with the budget that just came out uh, earlier this week, this idea that we just need to help people buy stuff, you know, buy homes. Well, if the real wages have not been growing <laughs> for the last 30 years, then maybe getting them to buy things they can't afford is not the best solution to say a housing problem, uh, rather producing more of those houses and making sure that they're affordable, having a proper social housing uh, policy would be better. And so the fact that we just kind of bring in a lot of finance, making it easier to buy things at the same time that real wages have been stagnant, you know, is exactly what caused the financial crisis. And by the way, it was just so striking to me in the previous UK election, where, how none of the parties <laughs> and none of the newspapers covering what the parties were saying confronted one of the biggest issues that we have. You know, of course there was Brexit, there wasn't yet COVID, but one of the biggest issues in the UK, for example, is just how financialized the economy is. And you really see this, for example, if you look at the ratio of private debt, not public debt, which everyone focuses on, private debt to disposable income. And the fact that that's actually what caused the crisis, this explosion of private debt, again, that people whose income um, 
incomes weren't matching that level of debt, you'd think that that would just be at least on the front page of the, of the Financial Times saying, uh-oh, we're back to you know, square one where we were in 2007. And so at least if that was the only problem, great. You know, if the problem was just in finance, and as I said, there's not enough finance going to the real economy, but the second issue here is just how financialized and extractive the real economy itself has become. And by real economy, I mean, you know, companies producing things that are supposed to be producing goods and services are increasingly extracting a lot of value out of production. Um, an old co-author of mine, Bill Azonic, wrote a wonderful piece and that actually won an award in Harvard Business Review um, around this. And he has you know, great data showing that, for example, in the last 10 years, uh, over $4 trillion uh, have just been spent uh, by companies on buying back their own shares to boost share prices, stock options, executive pay. And you know, in many ways, this is getting worse. We did a study together looking at Apple, for example. Apple under Steve Jobs basically reinvested almost all their funds back into production. Uh, they didn't do lots of R&D, actually. That was my previous book showing how much of Apple's uh, success depends on government-funded R&D, but they definitely funded a lot of important things like design and you know, creating these really sexy products we all seem to love. I have different eye products. Um, and under Tim Cook, actually, you know, a hundred billion share buyback scheme in Apple. That itself needs to be looked at again. Uh, at, at that intra-organizational level, because it's not true of all companies. It's not true if, if, if you take any sector, for example, telecoms, you might find that Cisco is you know, very financialized in terms of share buybacks and some other com um, companies that might be in countries which are less uh, driven by this maximization of shareholder value do less of that. So I'm thinking of, of companies like Ericsson. So that heterogeneity and company behavior and government behavior is a theme that I'll keep coming back to because otherwise we might get lazy with some of our terms. We can't just talk about the whole corporate world being extractive or, you know, or, or just engaging in this practice, but it is a problem. And this uh, data here also shows just less and less is being reinvested back into the system. And you know, this, this issue of reinvestment, let me just pause a minute because I think it should be said more than it is. This is actually the problem that we have today with modern technology. It's not the robots that are taking jobs, right? You will have heard, you know, robots are taking jobs. What's going to happen to the workforce with all this automation? Well, if you look back at the last 200 years, automation, mechanization, the industrial revolution has taken jobs. <laughs> um, it has been labor displacing. If you look back at Ricardo, David Ricardo's work back in the 1800s, his um, famous um, uh, textbook, Principles of Political Economy, chapter 31 called On Machinery. It's really weird how I remember these random things, whereas I can't remember what I did yesterday. Anyway, yes, it was chapter 31 called On Machinery. He was already talking about this problem of automation and what it might be doing to skills and employment. But what actually then happened for the next 200 years is even though he was right, as was Marx, it was mechanization displacing labor, as long as those profits that were being generated from the use of modern technology were reinvested back into production through that kind of creative destruction mechanism that also Schumpeter wrote about, then actually new jobs and new skills appeared elsewhere. Whereas this problem of value not being reinvested and this problem of value extraction that I focus on in the value of everything, this is the core, well, one of, I shouldn't say the only, one of the key uh, problems behind you know, the, the, you know, what workers are facing. They are no longer being invested in, uh, in terms of training programs and also kind of proper jobs by companies. And so we should stop blaming the robots. Um, and this is very much at the center of the dialogue uh, globally about uh, stakeholder capitalism. So if you've uh, been to Davos uh, uh, or heard about you know, people like Klaus Schwab, who's done you know, great work on stakeholder capitalism, this is the idea that actually this model of extractive um, behavior and just focusing on the bottom line is not going to kind of, you know, it's not going to help us achieve the kind of goals that we talk about, like the sustainable development goals. Um, and so this is why Larry Fink, almost three years ago in the business roundtable, two years ago, have been talking about the need for change. And again, um, I've, I've said, and I'll come back to this later, this change, first of all, it's not happening you know, quick enough. It's often just at the periphery of what uh, companies are doing. It doesn't go to their actual value chain. It remains to one extent or another around issues of corporate social responsibility. 
There are, of course, ESG targets that move us you know, closer. They need to be transparent. These are the environmental and social governance targets. Um, but we are not getting this kind of shift. If anything, as I just mentioned, some companies that used to be reinvesting their, their capital really into production, if you look at the data, they no longer are. Um, and so what does it mean to really do stakeholder capitalism? I'll, I'll come back to this later um, based on what I mentioned already before, that it only makes sense if we take it outside of the siloed little discussion, siloed discussion of intra-organizational corporate governance and ask what does it mean if we actually took this seriously and put it at the center of relationships between, for example, how business, government, and other actors work. Um, and another problem that I've been writing about for a long time is we also somehow have missed the trick with government, right? You know, government, uh, if it's framed as it is in economic theory as just fixing markets, by the way, markets do fail. So we do need to fix markets, but if at best you're fixing market and as if at worst you buy into the kind of, you know, Reaganite idea that government's almost always a problem. So do as little as you can, then please get the hell out of the way. Um, then it's, it's very hard to have that transformational growth. So forget Reagan's words, think more of the illuminated words of economists of you know, identifying different types of market failures. The problem is if you're just bandaging things up um, and have to justify any sort of policy by first saying, where's the market failure to be fixed? Uh, it's gonna be really hard to have transformational growth and structural change. Um, and even the fact, if you think about it, that public goods, which address the positive externality uh, type of market failure that they're seen as corrections for something that the private sector is not doing, you know, is, is, is part of the problem. So I, I've been thinking and, and writing about recently, um, it might be my next book, uh, on the common good as a broader, a broader way to frame the public good problem. So as not a correction for something that's missing, not a filling the gap but really about how to frame a common objective, right? The common good as a common objective of what we want to do, what's right to do, and how are we actually going to do that together? And how will we govern that collective production together? And that requires something that goes beyond the public good. But you know, a pollution seen as a negative externality, requiring something like a carbon tax. Yes, of course we need carbon taxes, but we need much, much more than that to fight pollution. And that requires what I, we'll call in a minute, uh, market shaping, not just a market fixing approach. But this idea that you're there just to fix markets, then also one of the problems is it doesn't justify the, the needed investments that we need within state institutions in order to actively co-create and co-shape markets, not just to fix them. And again, this is something I've been writing about for a while. Um, I actually was, was uh, keen on trying to get an artist, I talked to Anthony Gormley about this, to do one of those fourth plinths um, you know, in Trafalgar Square as a big clock, like the Times Square clock that has the public debt. I said, why don't we have a, a clock of just how much government is spending on consulting fees? This was in the time of Brexit where I discovered that there was billions being spent by government on uh, uh, consulting management companies uh, to basically manage Brexit. Um, and what's interesting is there's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The less you think that you're an active value creator, you think you're there at best to enable or de-risk uh, the private sector, again, at best to fix market failures, you also start investing less and less in your own capacity. And, and the risk is you actually, actually become incapable and actually require that help from the outside. Even when you are capable, obviously we all know there's strong ideological, uh, tendencies that, that get us things like privatization and outsourcing, and I'll come to that in a minute. But even without that, if you are not investing because of those problems inside your institution, you actually will become overly reliant on some external uh, financing and capacity because you are no longer uh, capable. And the fact that Lord Agnew, this, this man who you see here, he, was a, he is a, a, a Tory Lord in the UK government when he uh, recently said that uh, this over consultification of the UK government is infantilizing the public sector. I just thought that was such a you know, perfect word, uh, very tragic, but perfect word, this infantilization of state institutions because we no longer believe in them. And it causes that again, that self-fulfilling prophecy. So in one of the chapters of the book, I don't have time for this, but I, I look at how all those dysfunctions in finance, in business and in government are also fed by these kind of myths um, of how value is created, of you know, how markets are structured, what actually determines the market, what is the market, 
uh, myths around efficiency, this idea that governments need to be run as efficiently as the private sector. So all the ideas from new public management, public choice theory, um, which you know, we've also seen in um, universities in terms of how they've become overly managerialized. Um, and uh, the, you know, the fact that capabilities are not being invested in, as I mentioned before, and, and all the kind of ideas around outsourcing that actually flows from these concepts of, of public and private efficiency, uh, but also the fact that we don't really confront in an explicit way the fact that the economy has not only a rate of growth, but also a direction, even deregulation provides a direction, right? It's not just about direction, like let's go solve big problems, but you know, really making sure that we understand how different actions in both business and government and other institutions result in a directed type of growth. And if we want more inclusive and sustainable growth, then the tools themselves in both the private and the public sector needs to be redesigned in order to bring us there. Um, and that issue of value, that first concept there is really, you know, um, I, I was quite struck actually in a panel that I was in for uh, the first day of the World Economic Forum a couple of weeks ago, where actually it was Klaus Schwab himself who was giving a, a great, you know, uh, um, five minute speech about the book that he's just put out on stakeholder capitalism. But I confronted him when he said, uh, you know, stakeholder capitalism starts with the fact that businesses create value and then we need to make sure that value is shared widely across the community. And I was like, oh, wait a second, that can't be. You know, stakeholder value must actually begin with the notion that it's not just businesses that create wealth. Wealth is actually created collectively by different types of institutions and hence their organization actually matters. Um, let me just turn on the light. I realize as the sun goes down, um, I will end up in the dark. Um, right. So, um, and so a new approach has to, you know, really then be founded on, you know, going back to those kind of first principles. What are our understanding about value? You know, production functions don't really have, for example, uh, in, in economics, government as an active entrepreneur and value creator. Uh, governments can be funding some of the basic stuff in the background, the horizontal conditions like, you know, uh, public institutions around, you know, universities and education and infrastructure, but the value creator, the entrepreneur is really within uh, business and the fact that even so much progressive uh, talk, um, and I'm thinking also in terms of uh, how people win elections, everything about the Labour Party, you know, unfortunately, we don't have enough new language. I remember when Labour lost, when was it, Ed Miliband versus David Cameron, the next day, there were some very senior labor figures who uh, had written some uh, op-eds in The Guardian saying, we lost because we didn't embrace the wealth creators enough. I was like, no, you've lost because you don't talk about wealth creation as a collective enterprise and don't have sort of a different narrative about that. Um, and, and I do think actually that progressives need to be as on top of wealth creation as they are rightly so on wealth redistribution. Of course, we need progressive tax you know, systems, but there's nothing to distribute and to redistribute through tax if we don't also have a dynamic approach to wealth creation itself. Um, and this is why, oops, it's not supposed to say a new, new approach, it's just supposed to say a new approach, um, or I could say a new, new, new approach, three books. Um, <laughs> so the reason I wrote The Entrepreneurial State really was about just kind of debunking that idea of where innovation came from. So it was a book about, you know, all the technology in our, you know, smartphones, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri actually came from government funded uh, uh, agencies. Uh, it didn't mean it was all government money, but government finance actually stimulated a lot of other types of finance, whether it was through procurement or direct forms of investment. Of course, it was important to have companies like Apple put together those technologies and really well-designed products. And that's why we buy them. So it's not about dismissing private sector investment, but actually that high risk taking that government institutions often take in the early stage, the high risk early stage of technological development um, and not just basic research, also in terms of the finance that's provided to, for example, startups in order to scale up. So the role of public banks and so on, just that story, unfortunately, is not understood enough precisely because it's been framed so much in terms of fixing markets. And in the second book, um, The Value of Everything, I kind of unpicked some of the uh, problematic ways that we think about value that has then led to these misunderstood uh, uh, ideas of where, again, wealth comes from, but also the fact that how we distribute wealth, if we want it to be more 
socialized without necessarily talking about socialism. You still want to socialize wealth that's created collectively that does actually require a collective theory of value creation. And I looked at different sectors from health, energy, and so on, where we've gotten it very wrong and digital platforms, especially where again, we somehow invested in all this great technology and then forgot to govern it so that you know, the people who are actually paying for it can benefit. Um, you know, so like Shoshana Zuboff says, she says, you think you're searching Google for free, actually Google is searching you for free. Um, and in the third book, and this is what I'm gonna really be focusing on today, mostly, um, kind of be because I've been working with policymakers globally in both developed and developing countries on this issue of bringing purpose and public purpose to the center of development policy, of industrial policy, of innovation policy, I, 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 I decided to write a book that could be understood by everyone. So it wasn't just a policy wonk, kind of a pamphlet on mission-oriented innovation policy like I did for the European Commission, but just this idea of, hey, we can do so much better. <laughs> you know, We got to the moon and back 51 years ago by an extraordinary amount of public and private sector investment. Let's look at how they actually work together and then to tackle today's SDGs, these societal problems that we have that are so much harder than just going to the moon, just going to the moon. Um, you know, what can we learn from that, but also not learn from that? What are the ways that we can really tilt the playing field towards the direction of sustainable growth? And what does that mean for a new understanding of government and business and how they can work together in more symbiotic ways? And this need really to go from a market fixing to a market shaping approach, you know, I, I really think we need to go back to some of the great authors like Karl Polanyi, who in The Great Transformation was very clear that you know, the free market doesn't mean anything. And given that what we think, well, what we call the free market was actually forced into existence by uh, lots of controlled interventionism. If you haven't read the book, I'm sure many of the students online here have, if people haven't, do read the book. It really debunks even the notion of you know, the state versus the market in that way that I talked about in the beginning. The market is not the same thing as business. Um, and markets have very much been the outcomes of an enormous amount of state, uh, not just investment in the ways I talk about in the entrepreneurial state, but kind of you know, governance of the system and regulation. Um, and, and Keynes, of course, I think has been so misunderstood. You know, he's not there saying we just need public investment in a moment of crisis, as many people, including myself, will say during a crisis, of course you need public investment. Otherwise, you know, pre-Keynes, we got all these recessions that constantly turned into depressions. Uh, Keynes's work kind of reminded governments that actually if they did that, if they cut back when everyone else was cutting back, then that's why you get this vicious cycle. And in fact, if you look at the data, which you know, it's always good to look at data over the last kind of 200, 300 years, there was depressions almost every 15 years, only after the, the great crash when you got Keynes in economics, when you started having this counter cyclical investment by government, you know, at the time when consumers are, are, uh, in, are spending less, businesses are spending less in, in bad times. If government does that too, then the whole economy spirals out of control. But he didn't just say that. That's what I mean by him being sort of misunderstood. He also, you know, there's great pieces in the general theory and other writings where he's saying, you know, it's not just about, you know, doing things a little bit better or a little bit worse. It's really doing what's not being done at all. And so, you know, the bigger question of what do we want to do? <laughs> what do we want to do together? What needs to be done? What's to be done? Um, you know, this is when, where we enter the world of the sustainable development goals, which we should always remember have been out there for not very long, just five years. And that's a great way actually to frame the what's to be done and how are we gonna do it together? And what's the role of government? What's the role of the private sector to do that? And one of the things I, I emphasize in the entrepreneurial state was that it's not public or private. Of course, it's both. But without that early stage, high risk, capital intensive public investment, but also the imagination of what to do, uh, then actually the private sector doesn't get kind of catalyzed and crowded in. Um, because what actually drives business investment, um, and if you speak to top you know, business uh, entrepreneurs, they'll say this, is the perception of where future opportunities lie. So if you're simply there kind of reducing you know, tax, for example, even in the stuff we like, like R&D tax credits or, or other forms of tax incentives, it doesn't actually create additionality. It doesn't actually create investment that would not have happened anyway. 
In fact, lots of policy when it's badly designed simply increases profits. <laughs> um, it doesn't actually increase investment. And there's no profits problem. I didn't have the data there. I have it sometimes in my slides, but profits are actually at a record high globally. So there's no profits problem. Um, how do you actually, you know, catalyze and nurture and kind of you know increase the expectations of the business community of where those future opportunities lie. Well, that's exactly what we should be having. We don't have often, we should be having in terms of uh, you know, ambitious and what I'll soon call mission-oriented uh, public investments. And so, you know, hence, this is where we enter into this mission-oriented approach. And the reason I spent a lot of time in this new book um, talking and using this word missions is if you look at what actually it took <laughs> to do something so hard, right? You know, we haven't delivered PPE for frontline workers. Surely that's easier <laughs> than getting to the moon and back again, right? So what did it take to get to the moon together? Through enormous amount of, you know, private sector investment and public sector investment really leading the way, but also putting strong conditions attached to what it meant to work together. And I want to kind of unpick that, hence the big words here. Um, well, it definitely took a huge amount of, of public sector leadership. You know, I have a, my next slide here, uh, the picture of Kennedy giving his uh, uh, great speech at Rice Stadium. But, you know, it, it was leadership that was actually quite explicit about how hard it was going to be, right? The famous line, we're doing this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We don't hear leaders saying that today. You know, we're going to fight the climate, cha you know, climate change because it's, it's incredibly important, but it's also going to be really, really hard. It's not easy. It's not just about carbon taxes. It's hard. We're going to have to invest. And it, we will fail along the way, but it's worth it, <laughs> right? It's all the risk-taking and innovation, the idea that you also have to change your own organization in order to do that. I'm going to be coming to all these in a minute. But also, you know, really kind of welcome all those spillovers that happen along the way. Think about money as something that you need to do something. So this notion of, you know, what do you want to do and then backtrack and find the money for it. Outcomes focus finance as opposed to, oh, God, how much money do we have? Okay, what can we do with that pot? Right. So very different kind of approach to what budgets are for and very much a partnership uh, 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 with purpose. Um, and what was quite striking was they had no clue. I mean, in 1962, these guys, mainly guys, actually many women, you must see uh, hidden figures. There was many women in the Apollo program. But in terms of, you know, those who were really thinking, how are we going to get there? Oh, my God. It's, it's, <laughs> there's, there's lots of different theories. You know, so the amount of risk taking, innovation, experimentation from day one was enormous. And, and as you know, also uh, tragic uh, failures where astronauts died, for example, in the Apollo uh, uh, one fire in January 27th, 1967. And what was, you know, quite tragic on that day was that they were having so many problems, even hearing each other, the, the three astronauts, when they were inside the uh, simulated uh, lunar module, because it was just a simulation that day. Um, and you had Gus Grissom saying, Jesus Christ, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three NASA buildings within a square kilometer? And this is why George Mueller, uh, who had come in from Bell Labs was so attentive. Uh, you know, his role was many, but he also was really attentive to the need for organizational change. So the fact that if you are a purpose-driven organization, whether you're public or private, uh, you need to also think, what does that mean? If you're really mission-oriented, have an incredibly bold task ahead that's going to require all this risk-taking, innovation, communication, horizontal communication, so learning and feedback effects, welcoming those feedback effects. What does it mean for your intra-organizational dynamic? And it was quite striking how NASA did something which you know businesses talk about all the time. If you go to business schools and MBA programs, they'll talk about strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. Why do they care about that? Because they're creating value and it's important to, there's that famous textbook by, um, I can't remember his name, called Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation. Why? Because when corporations become really big and bureaucratic, they worry and they say, you know, we can't produce value um, if we're slow. So they need to think about those things. Whereas with government, we just say, oh, so bureaucratic, right? So the word bureaucratic should not be a negative word. This is why I set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL. It's all about rethinking the state, creating dynamic bureaucracies precisely if we want to confront the biggest challenges over time 
and partner with other forms of organizations in dynamic and not static and siloed vertical ways. So, you know, rethinking the, the mature government organization is just as important as, as the uh, private sector, if not more, given its role. And, you know, it wasn't just an investment in aeronautics. Uh, it was huge amounts of investments in electronics, materials, nutrition, um, you know, lots of different sectors, the whole software industry in some ways came out of that because they needed to analyze all the data very quickly that was coming out of the lunar module. But you know, lot, this, th this table here comes from a NASA website page, you know, all 20 things we wouldn't have on earth without uh, space travel from camera phones, home installation and so on. But these were the spillovers. And what's so interesting to me, because I do work with lots of government organizations, including NASA, um, we did a report for NASA a couple of years ago, and maybe I'll just reflect quickly on that one, and I shouldn't be too, how do you say, dismissive or, or critical, but my, my experience, at least in working with NASA, is today they are focused more than ever because of the pressures they're facing um, on justifying economic value, just like universities always have to justify their economic value, you know, the value that they're going to create. Um, and ironically, that creates less economic value, right? All these spillovers here happened along the way to getting to the moon. They didn't care about these things in the same way that no one cared about the internet. When, they, you know, when, when DARPA funded the internet, it wasn't like, oh, we need to do the internet. Like today, everyone talks about AI and quantum computing. No, they had to solve a problem. The internet was the solution to getting the satellites to communicate in the same way that GPS was the solution to, you know, for the Navy to know exactly where the ships were, for example, in the sea. Um, and so a problem focused public sector, and again, think of all the problems we have from the ones I mentioned in the beginning, including the digital divide. What's interesting is you actually end up commercializing and creating economic value when you're not worried about economic value. When you're obsessing about it, uh, it's, it's much harder to do. Anyway, and one of the bits that I just found the most fascinating as I did some of the kind of you know, background research on secondary sources, of course, um, was that they really cared actually uh, the people working in NASA about how to partner with the private sector. There wasn't this myth about, oh, partnership, that must be good, you know, or ecosystems, a, a, a word that everyone uses as though it's a neutral word. Uh, I work again in the innovation space a lot, so you'll hear about innovation ecosystems. Well, what kind of ecosystem? You speak to a biologist, they'll correct you right away and say, sorry, what do you mean? Is it a you know, predator prey, parasitic ecosystem? Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic ecosystem? What are you talking about? And you know, NASA indirectly, I mean, they didn't probably talk about it that way, but they were interested in that. And so they changed, for example, the contracts, the procurement contracts that they were using away from just these kind of cost plus contracts that were easily gamed. It was very easy to just inflate costs. And if you think of what's happened in recent years in the UK health system with PFI schemes, you'll know what I'm talking about. And they um, redesigned them to be fixed price procurement contracts with strong incentives for continual innovation and quality improvement. So you were, you were rewarded if you want, if you did something on top of what was asked for, but there was a, fi a, a fixed price that was negotiated almost like you would today with, a, with, with say a prize scheme. Um, and also even more interesting, this I found fascinating, they put in clauses like no excess profits. <laughs> Uh, not no profits, you know, this isn't charity. We don't need philanthropies to go to the moon. Yes, make a profit, GE, Motorola, Honeywell, all these different companies, you know, lots of different companies participated, but let's share in the reward. So don't again, game the system. This isn't a gambling casino. This is a purpose oriented partnership and you will make money, but you know, a fair share, your fair share. This is not gonna become like, you know, banking. Um, and another amazing quote, uh, I have in the book is where uh, Ernest Brackett, when he, he was the head of procurement policy, said we also have to be careful of brochuremanship. In other words, we have to keep investing, and, and actually this was the point, we need to keep investing, he was saying, inside NASA in our own brain, our own knowledge, in order to even know how to interact with the private sector. Otherwise, we won't even know how to write the terms of reference, <laughs> right? So it's not about the state versus private. How can they both be structured intelligently enough, capable, and not just be wooed by, oh, wow, what a nice PowerPoint of what these guys are going to do in the day they didn't have PowerPoints that had brochures, hence the word here. Um, but, but it's such a careful reflection, if you think about it, the, precisely given Lord Agnew's point about when you're outsourcing all your, your own uh, capacity, you, you know, the risk is you get infantilized. Um, 
And yes, it cost a lot of money, but as Kennedy was uh, careful to say, even before he knew how much it was gonna cost, that it was still gonna be less than cigarettes, you know, how much we pay every year for cigarettes and cigars. Somehow that's always a good benchmark. But I think the other point here is, you know, it, what was so interesting was the reason it created then all those spillovers that I showed you before. And in some ways, the multiplier effect, the Keynesian multiplier effect was high given all those intersectoral spillovers and investments that got us things like uh, software is because it was organized well. It really was a dynamic innovation system. Again, it catalyzed a lot of uh, innovation in the private sector. There was different types actually of public organizations in the same way that in the entrepreneurial state, I argue, you know, it's NSF, it's DARPA, it's the NIH that spends $40 billion a year, National Institutes of Health and Drug Innovation. It's the downstream SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research Program that through procurement helps deploy and diffuse all this great technology across the economy. If you kind of break down what a dynamic national innovation system requires, we shouldn't be looking so much at the money that it costs. What really matters is how are we structuring? Is it all just top down money kind of or helicopter money, just throwing a lot of money at a problem without thinking of those also really you know, careful structures that you need across the whole value chain, but also within any one of those public institutions, you need that kind of NASA mentality at the time um, of thinking, well, what is a purpose-driven organization in terms of communication channels, dynamism, agility, flexibility, ability to pivot? You know, when do you know when to turn the tap off when something's not working? DARPA, of course, is very well known for that. DARPA is well known for having, you know, people come in, often from the scientific community for five years, secondment, they're actually told, take as much risk as you want. That's actually how you're gonna be, you know, evaluated. If, if you're just doing kind of boring, easy stuff, that's not good. Exactly the opposite of what we often have in the public service where, you know, the private sector is allowed to make mistakes as soon as a civil servant makes a mistake, uh, uh, you know, you're on the front page of the Daily Mail. So that welcoming of risk-taking experimentation is part of the remit itself. Of, of what you need to do, but also the learning that's gonna be required if you do fail. It's not good enough just to say fail, don't worry. Learning by doing, that learning requires investments in capacity. Um, what I argue in the book is that these lessons are important for the SDGs. Of course, it's silly to pretend that these incredibly <laughs> ambitious 17 goals are as you know, clear or uh, you know, as easy, again, if I can use that word, as getting to the moon. Um, in, in the book, I remind people of this wonderful uh, book by Dick Nelson, a, a wonderful uh, colleague and friend of mine who, from Colombia, who wrote a book back in, um, when was it, 1977, The Moon and the Ghetto. He said, actually, you know, solving the inequality problem, the ghetto problem as a symbol is harder. We're not achieving it than going to the moon. And part of that is also that we're not giving it as much urgency, right? Uh, you know, anytime we need to go to war, no one says, oh, Where's the money? We, sorry, we don't have money, we can't go. They go, <laughs> uh, because they think it's urgent. Kennedy thought it was urgent to beat the Russians, right? So they found the money, um, but that's only part of the problem. It's obviously much harder also to, to solve these problems because they require behavioral change, regulatory change, political change, but also a lot of investment, also a lot of collaboration between public and private and other actors. And I do think there's interesting lessons. And it's, 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 I really think it's wrong to just start with, ah, oh, the moon landing, that's just technology, that's just space. The problems of our time are just totally different. Well, yes, they are different, but what actually happened to do something that hard, let's at least learn from that. And of course we can add to it all sorts of other things like those issues around taxation, which I'll come back to. Um, and so what I did in recent years, um, and again, why I wrote the book has been to actually ask, well, what does it look like to have this kind of mission purpose-driven moonshot kind of approach to designing public policy, right? Again, it's not gonna solve all the problems, but just that redesign point. And, you know, especially around the areas that I've been looking at for many years, which are, as I've already mentioned, uh, innovation policy and industrial strategy. Um, you know, the risk that an industrial strategy is just the list of sectors, you know, in the UK, it was, uh, what was it, under Vince Cable's aeronautics, automobiles, financial services, life sciences, and the creative sector. Instead of you know, making up a random list of sectors or a random list of technologies, what does it mean to focus on the problems, right? You start with the challenges. Those are the SDGs. Sorry, guys, we've all signed up to them. Got to stick to them. But transforming them 
whether it's you know, the clean oceans one, climate change, ones around inequality, into concrete targeted missions where you can actually answer, did you achieve it or not? Because the problem is if you just keep it really wide, like you know, no hunger, well, it's gonna be much harder <laughs> to say you know, no hunger. Whereas if you have a, a very specific mission around food poverty, and we can talk again about examples around the world that we've been working on on that, even in Camden, Camden Council, we have a new commission looking at food poverty. What does it mean to design missions in such a way that like the moon landing, get as many different sectors? You know how I said it's not just aeronautics. Well, any, any sustainability and, and, and um, you know, mission around climate change can't just be about renewable energy. You need as many different sectors as possible. And how do you then design procurement grants and loans and so on to really catalyze and galvanize that bottom-up experimentation right, all these projects and mission projects, so that you're really picking the willing. This is not about picking winners, it's picking the willings, really setting the, you know, setting that, that clear direction. And I do think it's actually the political process that needs to set that. You need to win the election based on your thinking about the Green Deal. But once you're in, what does it mean to allow, you know, different departments really to come up with uh, missions that are able to address challenges as bold as the Green Deal, but in designing it in such a way that does actually get all that uh, intersectoral collaboration and bottom-up experimentation. And these are just two examples from the um, that European Union report that I wrote on the back of which actually the commission through the council and the parliament voted on the policies that were being advocated in the report. So missions today are actually a uh, a uh, legal instrument within the Horizon program, the 80 something billion Horizon program, so that instead of just talking about challenges, we can, you know, the, 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 the program is trying to foster as much investment towards concrete missions, which again, like the plastic free ocean one or 100 carbon neutral cities uh, by a certain year will require all sorts of investments by sectors as different as real estate, waste, design, AI. Um, but I just want to repeat, this isn't about, you know, the state doing everything or micromanaging it, but it is about the state actually setting a very clear direction and then trying to get as much experimentation by private and other sorts of organizations on the how. If you tell them how to do it, obviously that will stifle innovation, a top-down process. And that's why it's really important to get away from that ideology of top-down, bottom-up. As you see here, it's, it's, it's a combination of the two. Um, and you know, what are missions? They obviously have to be bold and inspirational in order to catalyze that kind of you know, dreaming of the, what we can achieve, like going to the moon. And you know, who decides what's bold and inspirational and societally relevant? Uh, well, it's especially important, I think, for societal missions to bring different voices from society to the table to do that. It can't just be the, the usual you know, academic, business leader, and policymaker. And this is why the whole issue of citizen engagement Obviously, it depends what missions we're talking about, but surely a city level mission around, say, carbon neutrality has to have citizens engaging in the places that they're living uh, around that. And this is why uh, the recent um, commission that Georgia Gould, who's the labor leader, council leader here in Camden, we're, we're co-chairing a Camden Renewal Commission where we're focusing a lot on that issue of engaging citizens, um, for example, in housing estates, if we have carbon neutral agendas around social housing, bringing the housing authorities and the citizen assemblies to the table and actually thinking about how do we want to live together in more sustainable ways. Anyway, missions have to have a clear direction. You know, you have to be able to say yes or no, ambitious while real realistic, galvanize that cross-sector and interdisciplinary uh, um, investment. By interdisciplinary, as an academic, I should say that my experience is there's too little focus on some disciplines when we think about these issues. You know, it's not just the STEM subjects or economics. It's also poetry and humanities. You know, the fact that so many kids, I mean, definitely my kids and all their friends know about the plastic free mission. That's not because I or a policymaker or a business person talked about it. It's because of David Attenborough's <laughs> a wonderful uh, Blue Planet uh, film where at the end, the last episode on all the plastic that's in the oceans really touched a nerve. People seeing these baby dolphins, you know, choking on plastic. What does it mean to broaden that out to think theater, you know, film, creativity, and all the creative arts really also coming to the table to help us all even have that debate of what kind of society do we want to, we want to live in. And again, redesigning those tools we have from procurement, grants, and loans to drive those bottom-up solutions. Um, and you know, a, a second report that I wrote was, which was on governing. How do you govern missions? Focused a lot on this issue of the dynamic capabilities within public sector institutions, and this is exactly what's missing in many 
parts also of the developing world when people say, oh, missions, moonshots, that's just for rich countries. Well, no, that's for any country that requires investment. And instead of just making, again, a list of you know, sectors, what does it mean to have a real future mobility agenda in an African city? in a Latin American city, in a European city, in a US city, it's, it's not about the developmental path. It's really about redesigning policy to confront the problems we have. And if you're lower down on the developmental trajectory, well, those problems, you're gonna have a lot more of them, whether it's the digital divide or you know, different problems around health and pollution. But it's, it's gonna be very hard to do a mission oriented approach if you don't also rethink the capabilities you need inside your public institution. So all these issues around failed states and weak states, well, you know, instead of just saying, oh, that means we need to privatize and bring in the World Bank to do things because the state is too weak. Well, what are the capabilities you require actually to be more problem oriented, to actually be solving the problems that citizens have, as opposed to just handing out money at best to categories like small, medium enterprises. And it's not that SMEs don't need the funding, of course they do, but they should receive it, not because they're small, <laughs> but because you're finding a way to, to, to really get them to be crowded in and to helping, again, solve uh, problems. And so that notion of picking the willing as opposed to picking winners. And if you're a small company helping you know, a, a country around whether it's a sustainability agenda or digital divide, you'll need extra support from the government, but you're getting it because you're willing to engage with you know, purpose-driven issues. Also issues around flexibility, adaptability that I've already talked about, portfolio management and so on. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned in the EU, they've actually chosen now five mission areas. Is this, oh, sorry, soil, health and food. That's the fifth one. Um, and the idea is that these are just broad areas and they now have these mission boards that are thinking about within these areas, how to um, you know, design missions in this way that I, I've talked about and we'll see where that goes. Um, but one of the you know, issues as I just mentioned is the dynamic capability, which includes how do we evaluate whether we've achieved them? You know, one issue is, did we reach the mission or not? Fine, did you get to the moon? Do you have a carbon neutral city? But also most investments are more complicated than that. And as I've already mentioned, they create all these spillovers along the way. We need to be able to, to capture and to talk about the spillovers, even for something like the Concorde plane, which in my view is more of a project, it's not a mission, but everyone thinks it was a huge failure because it's not fine, but actually all the intersectoral investments and innovations that happened along the way, regardless of whether it's flying or not, should be accounted for at least before we just you know, claim it was a massive failure. So from going from a market fixing to a market shaping approach, and sorry if you can't read what's in there, this is from a paper that we wrote actually for the UK Treasury in the run up to their thinking about um, changing the green book. The idea is you can't, you know, no one would have gone to the moon had it been evaluated ex ante in terms of cost benefit analysis or net present value. So if you're gonna do something difficult, as Kennedy said, it's gonna, you know, we're not doing it because it's easy, but because it's hard, what does it mean for both how you justify that investment. It's not that you're fixing a market failure, you're doing something ambitious, or you're going to do a carbon neutrality, you know, agenda, sustainable cities, plastic free ocean, fighting knife crime in London, and so on, because it's the right thing to do. But what does it mean also for being able to evaluate all those inter, uh, you know, intersectoral, but serendipitous and, and dynamic spillovers that happen along the way? We need that as a capability well, within the treasury at least. <laughs> um, and I already mentioned that the, some of the work I did with industrial strategy, what it led to, some close work I did with Greg Clark was actually to have a challenge oriented UK industrial strategy that focused on these four um, challenges. The AI data one is a bit odd because it's really just a general purpose technology, but the other three really are broad challenges. Future of mobility is obviously not gonna be reached just by thinking about transport, but all the different types of sectors that would have to be involved. Um, David Willits and I actually uh, set up a commission that we co-chaired. He's um, a Tory Lord. He used to be the uh, science uh, secretary of state and uh, sorry, science minister under Vince Cable. And uh, we tried to help the government think of, you know, missions underneath those four challenges after, um, after the government actually decided to have a challenge oriented approach. And what's interesting is if you have, you know, for example, a mission around sustainable, universally accessible travel creating congestion and, and uh, admission-free zero accident systems, you know, that's gonna require, as I keep using this word bottom-up innovation, but innovation in areas like disabilities. Whereas if you just you know, have a kind of a transport focused future of mobility um, 
system, it's going to be harder to then really reimagine all the things along the way, like how are you going to make sure that your public transport system is 100%, not 90, not 80, 100% uh, fully accessible by people with disabilities. And so that was, uh, that was interesting. And, then, and a funny thing was we had um, some of my advisory boards from the Institute came to our meetings, including um, Brian Eno, a music producer. And he kept saying, why do you guys keep assuming people want to get from point A to point B quicker. What if they just want to slow down <laughs> and see their city more, right? So again, that experience that people have in public spaces and so on obviously would be very important. And this is very much at the center also of some of the work we're doing in the Camden Renewal Commission. I promise to finish in five minutes, less than five minutes. Um, and so in the Camden Renewal Commission, we've been thinking about missions very much place-based, whether it's in our social housing, uh, whether it's in schools around uh, some issues around food poverty, focusing on school meals, inspired by some work that we've helped um, think about in Sweden, where Sweden is interesting because they have this mission, which is a fossil free welfare state. So everything the state does from public health, public education, public transport with that fossil free carbon neutrality mission in mind, but it lands in particular places like school meals, you know, healthy, tasty, sustainable meals, not just Ikea meatballs, uh, you know, where students would actually come again to the table to help design the missions, learn about it through their curriculum about sustainability and food production, but also be part of the monitoring along the way. If it's not very tasty, surely they will let the authorities know. Um, one interesting thing in Europe, and I don't think people realize enough how interesting this is. You'll remember that after the financial crisis, the European recovery scheme, the money that was given to countries like Italy in Greece or the pigs, that's what um, I can say that I'm Italian, Goldman Sachs called uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, the pigs, great name. Um, it would, you know, those, those, that recovery was based on austerity. They had to cut their deficits and that caused all sorts of uh, uh, debate and um, you know, more than debate. Um, and this time around the EU next gen uh, recovery package, which is close to a trillion is conditional on countries actually having a strategy on investing in areas like digital transformation and climate change. This is a big change. We should be celebrating that. Um, now, do countries actually have then the capacity? You know, they might come up with a strategy, but how are they going to do it? Uh, we did some work with um, Giuseppe Conte, the previous prime minister in Italy's government uh, around Mission Italia, precisely because there was this opportunity, this kind of investment driven Marshall Plan. Um, so I'll just finish um, my last three minutes here. The, the kind of pushback I get, <laughs> which I've been getting for the last 20 years is, is not surprising. Um, unfortunately, it's often what's there even ex ante, like even before you say something, it, just by reading the title, a mission oriented approach, a moonshot approach, the entrepreneurial state, you know, the idea is, oh, she must just be talking about the big state, spend more and more public money. And that's bad because it leads to public deficits. Well, read between the lines. It's not necessarily about bigger government spending more, but spending much, much smarter, right? As I said before, a lot of the public subsidies just lead to higher profits. How do you make sure that you have a more mission-oriented approach that actually does catalyze investment across different types of actors to increase additionality and the multiplier effect? And that really requires a different design of the policies themselves. Having said that, many different parts of the economy do need more money. Just look at the public health systems, which again, we're not prepared at all. It's also not, I've said this already, about picking winners. It's, it's about picking the willing. It's not about big siloed projects. It's about missions, setting a direction and missions that bring lots of different sectors and those bottom up projects. It's not about putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, and it's not about ideology. I was really surprised when John Kay wrote a, a review in the Financial Times saying, this is the great leap forward. Well, no, <laughs> uh, it's not just, you know, Chinese, you know, lots of money and in large institutions. Having said that, by the way, China is doing amazing things actually that some countries aren't doing because they have such a strong pollution problem. They're spending 1.7 trillion on greening their whole economy. And countries like Denmark, tiny country, is actually providing the high-tech digital green services to the Chinese economy to do that. And if, and if you kind of break down what both of those countries are doing, it's not about saying they're perfect in any sort of way, but it does require us to look at kind of a purpose-driven policy and what it requires across that public sector uh, a form of policy. But you know, one of my interests in China actually is 
is it going to learn the lessons of what happens when you just have large, you know, public uh, enterprises like the Chinese Development Bank? And what does it mean to think about it more in the way that Fred Block talks about in his work on the developmental state in terms of a decentralized network of different developmental state institutions really present across that whole kind of innovation chain? But these are the issues I'm bringing up in the book. And, you know, this is I've said what it's not. It is about solving problems together. It is about finding new forms of dynamic, uh, symbiotic, not parasitic public-private partnerships. And this does mean also governing it with an idea of the common good, right? So the vaccine, it's not enough to have it if then we privatize all the knowledge along the way with patents. This is why the World Health Organization is talking about the need for uh, a patent pool to drive collective intelligence. So maybe we can come back to this in the Q&A. And it's interesting how with COVID-19, some countries have really taken on this issue of symbiosis in how the recovery funds themselves are being uh, given out. So in France, the money that both Air France and Renault got was conditional on those companies actually committing to lowering their uh, carbon emissions. Um, I don't have time to talk about something interesting happening in Barcelona. Just to say again, the moon and baguetto point of Richard Nelson, this was already being talked about back in the day of the moon landing where you had you know, both this great song and poem by Jill Scott Heron, Whitey on the Moon saying, we're going on the moon when all these problems are on earth. But I do really believe that the lessons here about how do we have an investment trajectory and innovation trajectory and tilt the playing field also through the taxation system to be rewarding the kind of behaviors we actually need in order to move ourselves towards a, a better um, uh, system. I don't have time to talk about this, but the last chapter does look at all the different kind of theory we need around value, markets, organizations, finance, distribution. I've already mentioned all of these things, so I'll just maybe leave them up here for a second as I say thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Sorry if I spoke a minute over. Um, the institute where I work at UCL is very much about causing some of this change in thinking with policymakers. Uh, encourage you to look at our master's in public administration, which is just a, as much about the theory as the storytelling about new words that we need away from just fixing towards co-creating. So thank you. I will stop sharing and shut up. Mariana, thank you for that fabulous talk. And, you know, I can only quickly comment that if there was something ideological, it was John Kay's diatribe in the FT, I must say. Um, anyway, now we turn to Jonathan DeJohn for um, a, a, a 10 minute um, comment. Um, thank you, Mariana. That was a fabulous talk. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I'd like to start out by saying I, I think her work has been immensely important because one of the roles of a social scientist is to change how we, what type of questions we ask. And I think she's asked a very important one and she's also identified some answers that the, there's been a, a very important role that the government plays in shaping and creating markets. I think it's an important message that's been lost in a lot of discourses. Um, I think it, um, you know, it's, it's also um, a work that links in with literatures on the developmental state, on the literature on national systems of innovation, on Yuan Yuan Ang's work on directed improvisation in China, on the relationship between top-down and bottom-up um, production strategies. Um, I also think it links in its holistic ways to Sen and Drez's fantastic book, Hunger and Public Action, about the role of civil society in putting pressure and conditionalities on leaders to do the right thing. We can't just have a supply side view of government. All good theories of governance have to be supply and demand as basic economics will tell you or political economy. Um, I guess, I mean, there's, there's so much I could talk about but I will um, just kind of interrogate a few things about for the sake of provoking discussion. I think one of the first things, um, this draws on the work of uh, Hugo Pagano, who was at Cambridge and the University of Siena and um, Carlo Tepedes. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things to ask is um, about financialization. Why is it that entrepreneurs are engaging so much in buybacks compared to 30 years ago? Now, is it just financial deregulation or is it because there's a kind of monopolization of intellectual property you know, by the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks that are limiting 
very profitable investment opportunities because there's a kind of monopoly intellectual capitalism. And I think it's important when we think about what the problem is to diagnose where the problem is. Sorry, to diagnose with the source of the problem. And so according to Pagano, I mean, one of the problems with um, the system is that it's creating a lot of inequality because a few firms are dominating lots of the production. And it's also creating a dearth of investment opportunities because the big, the big tech is buying up anyone that challenges them. And so antitrust regulation seems to be one of the first places we need to start. Financialization might not be the cause, but a symptom of a deeper problem of the inability to regulate big tech. And I just put that out there for discussion. Um, a, second, um, a second point I'd like to, to make and when we think about missions is that um, when we think of the history of industrial clusters, it's important to remember that a lot of them were not really a planning story. I mean, they were, they were incidental. Governments provided a lot of the technology through, as Mariana has identified very well, but a lot of the you know, clusters that emerged, whether it's in Detroit in the 1930s or Silicon Valley or the Aerospace Center in Los Angeles um, or Route 128 in the, Harvard, in the Harvard MIT route, a lot of that was kind of that Albert Hirschman and Adam Smith long before argued was unintended consequences. Now the government played a crucial role but there was a very big time lag between when these technologies were created and when they became commercially viable. And I think that's something quite relevant to the students that are listening, the participants listening today, because less developed countries, you know, and I'll come to this, have a financing issue, is that if there's a very long time lag when you create a mission, how is that, you know, how are you going to assess when do you pull the plug? Who's going to help you fill the gap? And there's all this literature on you know, fine, uh, you know, resource gaps in development economics. And so I think you know, that's a quite important issue. Um, a third issue related to financialization is, I think is important. This is Carlotto Perez's point that it's very difficult to do impact evaluations on what current market processes are generating. There was an article in the Financial Times yesterday that quoted Carlotto Perez's great works on this. And that is that a lot of financial bubbles um, and Hayek made this point as well. And the United States is innovative because it's got the capacity to waste hundreds of billions of dollars. And of course, Hayek didn't say waste it because we don't, when you're talking about something innovative, we don't know ex ante who's going to become the next Steve Jobs. So if 20,000 dot coms invest in it through the venture capital funding and so on, we know, you know each year one person wins Wimbledon and everyone else loses it. That's what innovation is all about. We have to be able to expect losses and unrealized investments and business failures as part of the process. This again points to an enormous financial burden on countries. So, you know, Silicon Valley uh, has a venture capital system and an investment banking system. I completely agree with the story that the United States government's funding was very proactive and created these possibilities. However, you know, in the so-called financialized United States, why are, you also have to ask the question, why are all the dominant high tech firms in the United States? Mariana's work provides a lot of answers for that, but you know, Europe and other regions that are quite advanced have fallen behind. So there's something about the US system that's quite dynamic, if at the same time, it's also very unfair and, and, and doesn't create the type of welfare for its citizens. So I think we need to distinguish between what's dynamic and what's a fair welfare state. The United States seems to be still at the cutting edge and be able to do this, but in a quite unplanned way and in a way that requires enormous amounts of financial resources in development banking in investment finance and in public funding. Um, you know, and so I think um, the last thing I'll say about that is that you know, when we talk about discourses and, 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 her, and your work has been fantastic in this is that, you know, there's some aspects, there's some countries that can take advantage, don't take advantage of what they can. I'll just give the example of Germany. I, mean, I think the discourse around say, labeling a country neoliberal or not is a bit unhelpful when we think about policy because Germany is an example of a country that has probably the most monetarist conservative central bank in the world, the Bundesbank, which for historical reasons, you know, there's a phobia against inflation in Germany, which we can explain quite easily. On the other hand, the great credit rating and macro stability of Germany allows it 
its public KFW group to fund, you know, to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars, floating bonds on so-called neoliberal markets to fund industrial policy. And so I think we need, there's an old term, it's called a mixed economy. And I think when we break down processes of financialization and so on, there's certain countries that are gonna be able to take advantages a lot more than others. And, you know, certainly, you know, the China Development Bank can float bonds a lot more easily than the Bolivian Development Bank. And I think we need to be aware of that when we talk about industrial policy. Um, I, the, last, the last point, and I get, what do I have, James, about two minutes? Good. Two minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I think the last um, um, sort of point I'd like to bring up for the, the, in terms of discussion is... Um, examining the politics of, of missions or even in industrial policy, if you wanted to talk about more narrowly. I mean, I think a, a comparison between China and Brazil is quite useful. You know, Brazil has one of the best run development banks in the, in, in, in the world, Benedese. And, you know, and China does as well. I think when you look at the difference between the two countries, you know, Brazil has had some types of missions like Embraer, which have been very firm, similar to South Korea developing firms. I think firm formation and creative productive firms has to be a very important part of a mission in a less developed country because, you know, the advanced countries can take advantage of missions because they have the firms with the productive capacities to take advantage of ICT, nanotechnology, and so on and so on. But I think a lot of less developed countries don't have that. So that's still, I think, a bread and butter of industrial policy. Brazil also created through Embrapa a more decentralized, fantastic agricultural research system, which is a little bit more in line with the model of what you're talking about. So I think both types are, are quite important. But when we think of the differences, I do think we can't underestimate how important mobilizing resources are. I mean, the big difference between China and Brazil is not the quality of the missions or the intentions, or even how well run their development bank is. It's just one country can mobilize 35 to 45% national investment and savings, and another one cannot. It's about half that rate. And I do think missions are about experimentation, failing, failing better, and so on and so forth. And I think it's important to remember that basic aspect that, you know, investments the more you have, the more you're gonna hit something that works because investment, especially around innovation and missions are around experimentation. Things that we don't know are gonna work when we start out, but we know are important problems to solve. And you know, I think basic discussions of why macroeconomic policies allow China to emit many more bonds than Brazil, can mobilize much more national savings and investment than Brazil are important features when we talk about the feasibility of missions. And you know, I, we can have discussions about the politics of why that is more enabled in China than Brazil, but I'll stop here and leave that open to discussions. Thank you, Jonathan. We do miss you at the OSC. Um, Mariana, would you like to just take a, a few minutes before, a couple of minutes before we leave our YouTube audience uh, for an initial response and then we'll go oh. on to Q and A. Okay, so by YouTube audience when you leave. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. So, so interesting. And I've written everything down and I'd love to have a longer conversation with you about that. So, um, wow. Um, I mean, first of all, you very rightly so mentioned uh, Carlotta and she and I have actually written um, a paper together around some of these issues. What do we call it? Innovation as growth policy, where we really kind of brought forward also this idea of tilting the playing field, right? I mean, all this concept that policies are to level the playing field is just, you know, completely crazy. If if you don't have any objectives, fine, level it. If you actually have an objective, what does it mean to tilt it? Um, and really to redesign the whole system also, right? I mean, there's a lot of room also for tax. It's amazing. We still continue to tax, you know, materials more than we tax labor, for example. But the, one of the really important things that Carlotta talks about is the demand side, which you quickly mentioned in the beginning. She argues that, you know, the mass production revolution, which is one of the big, you know, technological organizational types of revolutions we've had would not have had the effect that it did globally around production, distribution, and so on, had there not also been demand side policies like suburbanization. And she says today, green policies shouldn't just be about green investment, but green demand side policies, which then provide a funnel for the ICT revolution, which hasn't actually been fully deployed. You know, it actually has that demand pull from green for IT. And I think it's just a really 
important point, but you also raised her name in terms of Hugo uh, you know, Pagano's work and financialization. And I've written a lot about that. So all I can say is the value of everything. I kind of focus on that problem. And I talk about people like William Balmol, who you know, distinguished the use of patents for productive versus unproductive entrepreneurship. And you know, the work that we've done at different sectors, we've kind of looked specifically because it can't just be kind of these abstract concepts. You need to show how actually patents aren't always bad. But if you allow them to go too upstream, if they're too wide, used for strategic reasons, if they're too strong, so hard to license, you, you know, patents become pure rent seeking, <laughs> you know, uh, tools. And that's what also increases inequality, but also, you know, creates secular stagnation, not because that's a deterministic feature of our system, but we've allowed it to be that way because of how we've allowed the patent system to be designed. And that's a tragedy because patents are a contract. It's a government given right for 20 year monopoly. What does the government get back in theory, diffusion and deployment instead of in the middle ages where there was all this secrecy. Well, you don't get diffusion and deployment at the end of the 20 years if the patents have been abused and used in all these ways that we know lots of companies do. Um, and your, your next point about the time, I mean, you know, that's the whole point. I mean, the fact that actually a lot of problems happen along the way, this issue of serendipity, but also that you need the right financial institutions. And you talked about the US. I personally think it's not the VC sector. I mean, the, you know, a, a well-functioning financial system is absolutely critical. And you need, you know, VC that's not just exit driven. The venture capital sector itself has evolved in the US. It's increasingly exit driven. They want to exit in three or five years through a buyout or an IPO. Bill Azonik and I wrote a paper called, you know, saying that that leads to plepos, productless IPOs in the biotech sector. So science doesn't benefit when you have all this exit driven finance. Having said that, the US does have a much more elaborate financial system, which has benefited places like Silicon Valley. But the scaling up process where all these startups that existed in Silicon Valley were able to scale up, that required just as much also dynamic procurement policy. Okay. And that's why it makes no sense just to set up a DARPA, say now in the UK, without really understanding that system-wide change to procurement and how, you know, in the US, 3% of each government department, and, and this could be equally true for a developing country. I mean, it would be even more important for a developing country. 3% of the, uh, of the ministry's funds, department funds are used to procure in innovative solutions from SMEs. That's been central to the US innovation system. And the VC sector, Fred Block has shown this in an article he wrote with Matthew Keller, the VC sector has often gone behind that, right? So SBIR funding comes in the early stage. VC is a, almost never in the really early stage. That's for you know uh, business angels and uh, and the SBIR or public venture capital like Yasm and Israel. VC comes on the back of that. So really having that dynamic public private you know financial system. The first thing is even just to map it because one of the problems with the VC is they get too much of the reward from it, right? This whole risk reward problem. If you are coming in later, that's fine, but then admit it. And why are you getting you know, this 220 model where even if everything fails, you get 2% and if things go well, you get 20%. Is that the right or the wrong? Should we redistribute those rewards? So we're socializing both risks and rewards. And last- Marianne. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. The la go ahead, I'm not gonna- No, cut no, no, I feel bad. Cut. I could go on, I'm, I'm terrible. Just, um, I've put in the chat a study that we did, what God, almost 10 years ago, it definitely looked younger, uh, in Brazil on BNDS, where we looked at you know, the, this very important point that you mentioned that we're building on the you know, work of obviously of national innovation systems, Chris Freeman and so on, but also this idea of an entrepreneurial mission oriented state. Brazil's actually a really interesting example. So in, in the chat, I put a study we did on, on a mission oriented approach to, uh, for Brazil's innovation system, also in order to understand where the Embrapas and so on actually came from. And you know, that's why it makes no sense to come up with categories like the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. Actually, they're so different in terms of exactly these kinds of institutions. Most Latin American countries don't have a BNDS. And KFW that you mentioned, the most interesting thing with the KFW in recent years has been its confidence to demand conditionality. So when the steel sector got a recent loan from the KFW, they demanded that the steel sector lower its material content, whereas you know, which they did through repurpose, reuse, recycle technology. So it's not just about where the funding comes from. And they, you know, the whole KFW was set up during the Marshall Plan years and was given much more freedom than many public banks have today. But also it's a level of confidence that you have in terms of striking that right deal. Most of the steel sector globally just gets handouts to survive as opposed to transform it in a green direction. Thank you so much. We're going to continue this discussion, um, but we're going to say at this point, um, uh, a goodbye to our YouTube audience. Uh, thank you for joining us for the whole series. Many of you I know have tuned in every week. 
And we'll be back with this series in the autumn um, at the same time. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll have Mariana and others join us again. Uh, so thank you.